All right. Well, ready for the word? Okay. Seems like there was something else I was going to tell you, but I can't remember, so just go. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, to be, we're just going to, you know, this month talk about leadership again, uh, spend some time on leadership principles. So if it sounds like a leadership school instead of a church service, uh, okay. <laughs> it's a leadership school for Jesus, right? Who is the greatest leader in the world? Amen. And what did he call you to be? <laughs> Leaders, right? He absolutely did. Of course, our, our message is the gospel. Always, always, always. Our message is the gospel. But leadership principles um, help us all to be more effective and to be more influential, to be more confident, uh, and to touch more people. So we want that. And I know that, again, there is a leadership call on our house, and as there is on every Christian church preaching the gospel. However, I'm just aware of it. God's been making me intensely aware of it, and I just want to embrace it, right, and say, okay, let's, let's learn about it. Let's uh, continue to pray that that leadership anointing, gifting, and mantle will increase on everybody here and on our house as a whole. Uh, that'll be awesome. So uh, 2 Corinthians 4.6, uh, I, I want to use this first because it talks about um, Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the greatest leader ever. He is. He changed, he changed the world and still changing the world. And uh, this verse says, it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. That's a reference back to Genesis chapter 1, right? Uh, who has shown now has shown in our hearts. Where there was dark hearts, now there is light shining in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this verse basically tells us, when you boil it down, that Jesus is the face of God. <laughs> He's the face of God. When God wanted to put on a face <laughs> so that you could see him, he put on the face of Jesus, born in a manger 2,000 years ago, and walked the earth, and there's that face. And uh, of course, not, it's not just the physical face we're talking about, it's everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did, right, that reveals, is the face of God, reveals God to us. And so the reason I'm reading this verse is because if uh, Jesus is the greatest leader ever, and he absolutely was, and is, then... Uh, who should we learn from? Leadership. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, is this what, um, how, how, what am I trying to say here? The, the leadership principles that Jesus used and lived and taught and passed on to his people is God's principles for leadership, right? They're God. And that's the kind of leader that he wants us to be. And everything that Jesus did, Jesus' leadership was actually a revelation of God, revelation of God's heart. Uh, and so we want to study that, we want to understand that, we want to be transformed by that because we are called to be his ambassadors, right? Talked about that a little bit last, last week, yeah. So as we see the face of God in Jesus, we want to be transformed in every way, including leadership. Uh, so last week we talked about the fact that we're all ambassadors for Christ, that's also in 2 Corinthians, isn't it? That, uh, you know, we've been given, uh, we've been reconciled to God by Jesus, and then immediately that we accept reconciliation, we are given the ministry of reconciliation to share that with other people. Uh, and, and, and also we read last week, uh, Jesus said, as the Father sent me, now I send you, right? So every Christian is, is sent. Uh, every Christian is called to be a leader. Uh, we just embrace that. We accept that. Even if you're uncomfortable with it, just just say yes to it. <laughs> you know, you, if you're uncomfortable with something that's from God and you can just say yes, that'll just fix it, basically. I mean, it might not fix it in five minutes, but it'll fix it within a short period of time. Just say yes. <laughs> and, then, and then your heart just starts to line up. It's a very cool thing. Just say yes. Holy Spirit can do the rest. Right? Uh, uh, last week, one of the things I talked about a lot, and I wanted to re revisit it, uh, is the idea of authority versus leadership. Uh, and we talked about uh, the system of Moses, right, versus Jesus, right, and that a lot of the church and a lot of church leaders, church, uh, church branches, churches, pastors, whatever, wrongly assume that Moses is the pattern for leadership, right? Because in the, in the covenant of Moses, and remember what, what did God do is he gave absolute fixed rules, commandments, and guidelines for everything, right, including what to eat and what not to eat, what to drink, what not to drink, what day to rest, I mean, everything, right? Told what you can do, what you can't do, boom. And that's the Mosaic system. And, uh, you know, a lot of churches, even today, still kind of like that because it's simple. You know, just give us rules, right? Give us rules. Tell us what's right and wrong, and we'll just tell people, and that's it. We'll put, you know, build little fences and walls around bad things and try and keep God's people, you know, saved until Jesus comes, right? And uh, they think that's a good style of leadership, and it's not. 
It's not. And the reason we know it's not is because Jesus ended that covenant, right? He came and fulfilled it and then tore it up and said, here's the real thing. Right? That one was just, just to let you know that you need a savior, right? And so here's the real thing. And Jesus unilaterally reconciled us to God by the cross, by the shed blood, and then invited us into relationship with himself, into relationship with God, and now says, I'm going to be formed inside of you. I'm going to live inside of you. And he used that you know, wonderful example in John 15 of I am the vine and you're the branches, right? So this isn't talking about rules and patterns, you know, things to do and not do. Vine and branches means you're connected to me and my life and my presence will flow into you and flow through you and you'll become like me and we'll be friends. We'll have a relationship and my power and life will flow through you and touch other people. You'll be transformed in the process. Hey, that's awesome, right? And in that, you know, talked last week a little bit about how there's freedom. Freedom is one of God's values, isn't it? Freedom is beautiful and dangerous <laughs> because there's more room for mistakes, right? Um, but mistakes, when you understand God's heart, mistakes are not as scary as we think they are, okay? Mistakes are not relationship enders, right? Mistakes are inevitable, inevitable, if you've raised children or grandchildren, you know that, right? <laughs> they will make mistakes, and you still love them anyway, right? And so God invites us into this, into this uh, relationship. Uh, so if the style of Moses as leadership is not what God's calling us to, it's, it's the leadership style of Jesus, then, of course, we want to understand that and embrace that. Uh, Let's see. One of the things that, that I said last week that I really wanted to explore more tonight, um, build on, I think I said uh, that using, if leadership is influence, and it is, right? It's, leadership is influence. So uh, if you're using authority for your influence, that's the lowest level of leadership. Using authority for influence is the lowest level of leadership. And I kind of said that and then, you know, sort of just moved on, I think. But... Uh, Afterwards, I thought about it. I'm like, that, that needs to be unpacked a lot. <laughs> you know, that seriously needs to be unpacked because it's super powerful, super powerful. Um, real leadership doesn't rely on authority, but authority is still a good thing too. There's a balance and there's a place for both, right? But real leadership doesn't, doesn't rely on authority to get the job done. Uh, real leadership says it's better to inspire than to require. <laughs> and uh, one thing also uh, it's, it was several weeks I don't even remember how long ago maybe several months ago I don't know on a Thursday night you know when we are doing the Thursday night Bible study and I remember hearing something come out of my mouth you know that sometimes that happens and I kind of go oh that was good I didn't even know I knew that or maybe I didn't know that until this moment you know but uh, said something to the effect that uh, it's best to use the minimum amount of authority necessary and the maximum amount of leadership possible. I don't know if you caught that. Best to use the minimum amount of authority necessary, but the maximum amount of leadership possible. And, and I've been just kind of, I, I heard that, or part of that at least come out of my mouth, you know, on Thursday night a while back, and I, I've just been thinking about it ever since, you know, and then combine that with the idea that the using authority is the lowest level of leadership. Uh, but true leadership is a much higher thing. It's better to inspire than to require. Hmm. And that's what Jesus did, though, didn't he? He changed people's lives so that they sacrificed everything, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. You know, they were inspired to follow. They were inspired to lay down their lives and trade everything for Jesus and, and what he was offering. So I want to explore that a little bit more. Uh, when I mean using authority for influence as the lowest level, what I mean by that is if you rely on your title, if you rely on your business card, if you rely on the sign on your desk that says boss, if you rely on the fact that you're the employer and you control the money or the paychecks, if you rely on, you know what I'm saying? If you rely on any of those things, um, do those things, do, does, does a business card or the, or the title or a degree make you a leader automatically? If you have a PhD or a master's in something, are you a leader? Not, not necessarily. If, you're the, if you have a card that says pastor on it, does that make you a leader? Not really. I mean, technically it's supposed to, but it doesn't. If you, you know what I'm saying? If you rely on those things, you're, what you're really doing is relying on authority when there's a lack of leadership. 
relying on authority, which is the lowest form of leadership. And so we definitely, we don't want to rely on those things at all. In fact, people that um, just have no authority at all, they have no position, no title, no degree, and no authority, but if they develop their leadership and become influential and help people and minister to people and build people up, you know what they eventually get? Authority. <laughs> they eventually get a title and a business card and a position and somebody says, you're the leader, right? You're the leader. Um, so. Leadership produces authority, but authority doesn't necessarily produce leadership. So we want to not worry about authority so much. I'm talking about dealing with people. When you're dealing with the devil, use the maximum amount of authority. Okay, <laughs> that's the whole different thing. When you're dealing with demonic stuff and spiritual stuff, use the maximum amount of authority possible. But when you're dealing with people, right? relationships, minimum amount of authority, maximum amount of leadership. Okay? All right, so, and that's really what we're talking about right now is dealing with people. Uh, it, it's uh, basically John 15, 15. I keep going back to this verse, but it, uh, let's look at it in that light. When Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants, a uh, servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I call you friends. So, you know, we, this concept, we go over it and over it, but I think it's so powerful to look at again and again in different perspectives. If you look at it from that perspective, Jesus is saying the servant-master relationship relies on authority doesn't it? The friend relationship relies on leadership and connection. So what is he changing from an authority relationship essentially to a leadership, friendship, connection relationship? That's what he's, that's what he's doing. So we're going to minimize authority, we're going to maximize leadership and connection. Ooh, that's very good. That's very good, huh? Is he still the Lord? Yes, <laughs> of course, still the Lord. But he's emphasizing, and this is a very legitimate invitation. <coughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> that was uh, actually, uh, when you, uh, John, I bet, knows this, uh, and some of you, some of you, when you're caring for people with handicaps, right? Uh, aren't you trained basically to give them the maximum freedom possible and use the minimum force necessary to protect? people or property or whatever, right? Isn't that true? Yeah, and that's, and that's basically, that's, that's a principle of, of helping handicapped people, especially mentally handicapped people, to give them maximum freedom, um, maximum enjoyment of life, maximum quality of life, with minimum authority, minimum force, minimum, you know, control. But some is necessary, huh? Sometimes, sometimes you gotta do that, don't you? But the idea is to use the minimum. And it's the same way. Uh, this, is, this is actually a biblical principle, um, that God wants people to have maximum freedom and, and under minimum authority because he wants us to become sons and daughters okay? who don't need to be told what to do. We, we are sons and daughters because it's who we are becoming. And we do what we do because it's who we are. Right? That's God's way. And that's, that's a whole big thing. I know, I know last week, too, I used the example of the... Uh, um, the artificial plant versus a real plant, right? And I love that example because an artificial plant, you can say, I want you to put your branch here and here and you look good in that corner and that branch will stay there and that branch will stay there for ever, <laughs> right? And all you gotta do is dust it once in a while. Um, but the real plant isn't as cooperative, right? But if you want to train it, you know, to go this way, you can, but you have to care for it and let it grow and nurture it and fertilize it and water it and, you know, train it to grow this way. And it's a lot, much longer process. The difference is this thing may look the way you want it to look and it's instant, but it's not real. Right? And it's all external. This is genuine, true, and real, the real plant, right? And that's what God's doing. So, you know, again, the point of that is when you're leading people and influencing people and helping people to grow spiritually, uh, the, the real growth is much slower. Real change is much slower. If you imply, apply religion on people, you can get them to, like the artificial plant, you can get them to do what you want them to do pretty quickly if you apply pressure to people. A lot of people will buckle under it. Religion has proved that. But it's not real. Real change is much slower, but it's real, yeah. Um, and uh, something, something we talked about last night in uh, Thursday, in Thursday night it came up, uh, is that uh, there's a difference between authoritative and authoritarian. Anybody know those words? Yeah, yeah, you probably do. I'm um, sure most of you do. Authoritative means you have authority and it shows, right? Authoritarian means you use your authority to control to kind of hardline, get people to do what you want them to do. 
And the reason we were talking about that is because last night we were talking a little bit about the voice of God because Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, right? And they follow me. So if we know his voice, you know, we were talking about what are some of the qualities of the voice of the Lord. And one of the things is that the voice of the Lord is authoritative. When God speaks, there's authority in it, isn't there? Absolutely. But it is not authoritarian. God's voice is not demanding, you do it or else. You do it because boom, you know. It's, it's not that way, but it's authoritative. And in it, there's freedom, and he wants us to obey, doesn't he? He wants us to respond, but he doesn't stand there and stomp his foot and push you. He doesn't. It's not his way. Okay? It's just not his way. So if that's the way Jesus is, then that's the way we want to be also. We do have authority as God's people, right? There's authority growing inside of us, right? And we have his name, and we're seated with him on the throne, and we're growing in authority in many ways. We're growing in leadership, but he doesn't want us to become authoritarian, because that is demonic, frankly. <laughs> it really is. And uh, it's huge. It's, it's really important to understand that difference. It's a huge thing. Um, Galatians 4.19. <clears throat> uh, love this verse. It's, just, it's illustrating the same principle that uh, when, you know, Paul said, my little children for whom I labor in birth until Christ is formed in you. He was, you know, he was concerned about the church there in the area of Galatia. And he is, uh, he'd raised up that church, you know, but, but religious people had come in and were imposing Jewish law again and trying to bring these new Christians into, you know, into Jewish law. And Paul, he wrote the book of Galatians and said, don't do it, don't do it, right? It's, it's the gospel, it's Jesus, it's grace, it's the finished work of Christ. And he said, here's what really what I'm after. I'm laboring in birth again. He means in prayer and in intercession for these people that he's a spiritual father to them. And he says, and here's the goal, the end, the end result is until Christ is formed inside of you. Okay? That's a whole different thing from do this, don't do this, eat this, don't, don't eat that, do this on this day, don't do this on this day, and don't drink that, and don't touch that, and don't look at that. He says, no, I'm going to live inside of you, and Christ is going to be formed in you. Right? And then you'll do what you do because you're becoming who, you're, who you are, right? <laughs> who God's called you to be. Yeah. And it's, it's such a whole different thing. But leadership, true godly leadership has to acknowledge that. And, uh, and there's, uh, I know that leaders get impatient with people. I know that Christian leaders get impatient with people and are very, very tempted often to impose, to, to use authority to get quicker results. Just do it because, right? Because <laughs> I say so, I'm the pastor, or because God will be mad at you, or whatever, whatever they use, you know? And uh, it's very tempting to, to lower yourself to use authority to get quicker results. But it's always shooting yourself in the foot. It's always external and usually backfires on you, right? And, uh, and it's, frankly, uh, it's unchristlike. It's ungodly to do that. And so we help people to grow uh, with patience and love, knowing that <laughs> all of us as leaders, we needed time to grow too, and still growing. Amen? <laughs> uh, does Jesus use authority, though, even in the church? Yes. Matthew 18, 15 to 17, is an interesting principle that Jesus taught us. And, and uh, I'd never seen this before today in this light, but uh, today kind of the Lord brought me back here, and I went, oh, how cool is this? So you'll remember this, most of you. Jesus taught this. Uh, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And he's, he's preparing for the church, right? This is, this is preparation for after the cross and resurrection and the birth of the church. And he's talking about how we deal with problems and issues in the church. So he says, if, so, if your brother sins against you, does you wrong somehow, and it's, it's a big thing, you know, not little things we let go, right? Lots of little things. Just let him go, let him go, let him go. But, but if it's something that matters, he says, go to, you, or go to him alone, and if he hears you, you've gained your brother. Yay. Okay. And then what, it, there's an escalation, though. If he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And 17, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. Right? Essentially, you're out. <laughs> you're right, you're, and uh, and I, I, you know, I've... I've uh, talked about this various times and, you know, learning to apply it, right? right? Because and I remember one of the times we talked about this verse kind of recently is the idea of just, you know, relationships, becoming good at relationships. And the fact that most people really, really, really don't like confrontation, right? 
And, and a few people really like it, but <laughs> most, most of us hate confrontation. You know, We run from confrontation, do anything possible to avoid it. But when you're part of a body in a church and it's important, when things are done that are wrong, he says address it, right? To go, go, go deal with it. But what's interesting, uh, what I never really noticed before, the way it begins, 15 again, if you would, please. 15 begins, he says, go to him privately and alone. And it's, and it's coming at this, uh, is this coming at it from the level of leadership and connection or from the level of authority? This one's starting with the level of leadership and connection. Let's do it privately, let's do it with honor, let's do it with leadership and connection. And if he hears you, you're done. It's over, right? But then, 16 and 17 says if he doesn't hear you, then you take one or two more, and then if he doesn't hear you, then you tell the church, and then the church has to deal with it with authority. So you start with leadership and connection, and ultimately, if that doesn't work, you go to what's left is authority. So is there a place for authority? Yes, but it's not the first go-to. Isn't that fun? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, there, but it does have to be used sometimes. And, and I know that from experience. I mean, in, uh, in the years that I've been you know, pastoring, uh, there's probably been half a dozen times where I had to tell somebody, you know, there's the door, go there now. <laughs> you know? Go through it and don't come back ever, ever, ever. You know? maybe, maybe half a dozen times in many years. You know? and, that was, and I did that. I would, I would start with private and you know, usually uh, private or you know, trying to maintain their honor and deal with something privately. But then you know, if it didn't get taken care of, that's where I would go to. Uh, and there's been a couple of times when I went directly there, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, it was necessary. Somebody causing an immediate disturbance, you know, and I won't allow that. So, but, but generally, I think it's illuminating that Jesus basically gave us this principle of always start with leadership and connection. Only use authority if you have to. But if you have to, it's there. Hmm, interesting, huh? Uh, also, Jude 1, 14 and 15. Uh, right now, Jesus, we're, in a, we're in what's called the, the age of grace, right? The church age, the age of grace, and the gospel is being preached. Uh, and all those that that choose to believe and say yes to Jesus become his people. But there's also this, um, <laughs> this promise. Uh, it said, e Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men. These are talking about people who basically reject Christ. They may, 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 they may pretend, but they're really not. They're really rejecting. Um, saying, behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Uh, how many times does he say ungodly in that, <laughs> that verse? <laughs> yeah, that was apparently Enoch, who you read about very, very early in the book of, Gen of Genesis, and he, he was a prophet, and he prophesied the return of the Lord. How cool is that? But again, notice what it says. It says basically there will come a point, right now Jesus is offering leadership and connection. But for those who ultimately reject him, and people will increasingly become hostile towards God as, you know, as we get closer to the end, uh, this again shows the principle. He's starting with connection and leadership, but ultimately he will use authority for those where that's the only thing left. But go back to 14 just for a second. I wanted you to notice something. Enoch seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying, behold, the Lord comes. What does it say? <laughs> it's the first immediate word. The Lord comes with. All right. So, and who's the ten thousands of his saints? Oh, that's us. All right. Okay. So is he coming back to judge us or is he coming back with us to judge the world? just wanted you to make sure you noticed that, by the way. Because those who accept connection and relationship by, through the cross and the resurrection, we come with him. <laughs> Amen. And he leads us. But those who reject, ultimately all that's left is authority. Uh, you kind of get the idea, huh? Authority is not the first go-to, but, but there's a time for it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 5 to 8. Uh, Paul is talking here about uh, an incident where he's asking people to give financially 
in the Corinthian church and some of the other Gentile churches. He's asking them to give financially back to the, to the mother church kind of in, in Jerusalem, right? That was going through a time of famine, a time of shortage. And he was raising an offering. And so here's what he said. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and to prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of, notice the wording, generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Huh, isn't that interesting? Do we see the principles there of connection and leadership and the principle of authority? He says, I want it to be leadership and connection. I want it to be from your heart. I want it to be because you want to, you believe in it, right? I don't want it to be obligation. I don't want to use authority to do this. Because when you use authority to get somebody to do something, it doesn't count. <laughs> they didn't really want to. It doesn't count. So if you get people to behave a certain way just by purely by authority, it doesn't count. It doesn't mean anything. That's why leadership is so powerful when you can influence people in a, in a positive way, in a real way, and bring them closer to God and help them to develop that connection with God and to grow into that, right? The same way you're doing and you're bring, helping them find the same thing. That's real. Amen. That's real. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what's the next one? It, I think it says virtually the same thing, but I put them both up there. Oh, no. Uh, Psalm 110, verse 3. Yeah, sorry. We just read this a couple weeks ago, didn't we? And it talked about the Lord said to my Lord, come up, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, right? Talking about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. And then he says, your people shall be again. What? <laughs> Volunteers. Slaves, servants, required, pressured, obligated. Volunteers. Free will. Yeah. God's people are free will volunteers because of the leadership of Jesus that he inspires rather than requires. Right? And we say, we want to follow you. We will lay down anything to follow you fully. Wow. And anything that is laid down because of pressure or obligation doesn't count anyway. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 12. Uh, this is Paul teaching the church in Thessalonica, uh, and he's talking, right in this particular little passage, he's just talking about some practical matters of people there who uh, were disorderly troublemakers and they didn't work, uh, but they kind of wanted to, you know, be little parasites kind of and, you know, and uh, get help from the people that were working. But Paul's dealing with that, and he has some really pretty, oh, sorry, pretty... Uh, straightforward stuff to say. He says, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, Notice the word authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. No, notice what he's saying here. When we came to you, we could have used authority to require you to take care of us, the apostles of God traveling in this area. They said, we didn't want to use authority. We wanted to be examples. We wanted to do this in a way that was, you know, where you, you had the choice, right? and be an example, a positive example. Amazing. Even when we were with you, we command you to do this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, interesting. That's in the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> 11, 12. Okay. We hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Uh, now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. And so obviously there's, there's times, you know, when, when people cannot work and that's a whole different situation. But he's, he's addressing basically people who can but really don't want to. Uh, but just notice again what he, uh, go back to the very first, was it verse 6? 
Uh, but we command you. Is commanding, is that, is, that's authority, isn't it? That's authority because what's he dealing with? He's dealing with an area of people that are just really defiant and, un, you know, rebellious kind of, and they're going to do what they want to do, you know, and he's responding with authority. And sometimes you respond with authority more quickly because it's appropriate. <laughs> sometimes authority is appropriate. You just deal with something straight on. But go ahead. He's, but he's talking about those people who are being disorderly and, and you know, not to let them not to let them disrupt everything and cause problems. And then uh, just go on again. We, you yourselves know how we, you ought to follow us for we were not disorderly among you. We see, follow us means he's referring to himself as a leader and setting an example. And this is really the kind of leadership he wants to have. We didn't eat anyone's bread free of charge, we, but we worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. No, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example. Yeah, so he's saying, I don't want to rely on authority. I want to rely on leadership. Leadership is higher. And what you do voluntarily is what counts. Right? Whew, hallelujah. Hmm. Uh, what's the other one? 2 Corinthians 10, 8. Actually, you know what, before I comment on this one, you know what that reminds me of is uh, we read a verse just a couple minutes ago where he was raising that offering, right? And he said, I want it to be, uh, f you know, from your heart, not because of grudgingly or under obligation, right? And uh, in, in the Christian church as a whole, um, how many people have just had real irritation with the way offerings are handled a lot of times? Anybody? Okay, two of us. Thank you for that. And... Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> really, how many of you? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and one of the things that, I, I, I remember being in meetings, you know, have you ever had your arm twisted so bad that, yeah, right, and being in meetings, I've been in meetings where somebody was trying to raise money for their offering, for their, you know, ministry, and I don't have a problem with that. Take an offering, absolutely. Tell the need, pass the basket. I have no problem, that's how this works, right? But they would, I heard someone say once, don't, don't even ask if you should give, Ask God how much, you know. And I immediately thought, <clears throat> how dare you take away my choice? You know? Don't, don't, that's a sly way of manipulating. Don't take away my choice. My choice might be, I don't want to give in this offering, or I can't, or I won't, or for whatever reason, I don't like your ministry. <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? <laughs> that's it, or I only have $5 and I need gas to get to work, you know? Whatever. Don't take away my choice. You know, right? And uh, I, I just, I don't like that in any way. And then I'm always thinking about what if there's somebody in this meeting who is not really a committed Christian and they just heard that and thought, oh, this is just another place where they work you for your money. Ugh, I'm out of here. Oh, don't do that. Don't do those things, right? Just <clears throat> to have integrity and trust God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.8 says, even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority... Paul talking to the Corinthian church. Why is he saying this? Because uh, Paul was, was the apostle, right, that raised up that church. But then, uh, the, uh, again, it was a lot of the Judaizers, the Jewish, you know, legal, legal people that came after him and attacked his leadership and attacked his reputation and said, Paul's not a real apostle. Listen to us, you know. And, and, uh, and so Paul was, was spending a lot of the Corinthian letter defending his real apostleship. And that was only important because uh, if he's a real apostle, then the gospel he preached is real too. And if he's not a real apostle, that whole gospel of grace and the finished work of Christ, it's all wrong. <laughs> so defending his apostleship was really a big deal. It wasn't selfish of him. It was really a big deal. And he said, um, even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, uh, apostolic authority, he, he means, which the Lord gave us for what? <laughs> Edification. And not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed. He's saying, I'm, I'm defending my leadership. I'm defending my authority and my calling and my position, okay? I'm de defending my legitimacy as, a, as an apostle. But the reason the Lord gave me authority, it has one purpose and one purpose only. It's to build you up. Okay? It's not to throw my weight around and, you know, God uses author authoritarian means to control people. That's not what he's saying. I get, my authority is for one reason. It's to build you up. And if I misuse it, that's wrong. Right? That's wrong. Uh, do it, but then, you know, balance that with the fact that he said there are some times when you have to tell somebody, 
you're out, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, there are those times. But that's, that's also to protect the people that are, that are wanting to follow God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13.10 also. Says, uh, it's, it's virtually the same thing. Paul also said, therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for, again, what is it? <laughs> Edification, not for destruction. Not to tear you down, but to build you up. He said that twice. Paul knew he had authority. He knew that he had a leadership position in the church that was definitely given by God, even though it was challenged and criticized and all kinds of other stuff. He knew that he had it, and he knew why he had it. God's heart was to build people up, and he'll use leaders, appoint leaders to do that. All right, so we're getting the idea so far, right? Leadership, leadership and connection is the way to go. Just relying on authority is the low road. But there's a time for it. Uh, Ephesians 6, this is the last passage. It's in Ephesians 6, 1 through 9. Uh, but there's a lot here. So I still got, I'm gonna need a few more minutes to really unpack this part too. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. So now this is, this is going to deal with uh, you know, child, child raising, kids, parents. Right. Some of you are raising kids, some of you are raising grandkids, some of you are relieved you are not doing that anymore. <laughs> All right. All right. <clears throat> he says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. That's directly taken from the Ten Commandments, very cool, which we're, we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. However, this principle is amazing and is still active. He says, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. He said, honor your parents so that you'll be blessed and live long and prosper. Wait, that's Spock. Which one? Anyway, <laughs> but no, it's actually from God. And he said, one of the keys is honor your parents. Right? And, uh, and if that's difficult, still find, find what you can honor in the situation and honor them. Right? And, uh, and is, that, is that only physical parents? No, spiritual parents too, spiritual fathers and mothers, basically people in authority in your life uh, that contribute in some way. He says, if you honor them, there's a huge blessing on that. That's just, that's just, that's always in a principle and Paul quoted it, still applicable. And then verse four, he switches to the, uh, the fathers or parents. And he says, you fathers, it's, it's parents in the original it means and it says, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. I'll stop there for a second. This is really uh, powerful stuff. And it's only one verse. It's a verse on child raising, and it's one verse, and then he moves on. Boom. You'd think he'd have a lot more to say. <laughs> uh, but notice, oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to say here. All right. How do we unpack this? Do not provoke your children to wrath. You know what that means? Don't raise them in a way where they're continually getting frustrated and angry at you, becoming bitter and resentful against you. You know how that happens? When you rely on authority without connection. <laughs> Isn't that right? When you rely on authority, do it because I said so, do it because I will knock you out, do it, be, do it and don't ask questions, just do what I tell you, right? And will they do what you tell them? For a while, until they're big enough to leave or fight back. <laughs> when you just, when authority is your go-to position, it'll cause resentment and frustration and anger. Yeah. Now there's a time for it, isn't there? There's an absolute time for it. But then he says, instead, Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And what that actually reminds me of is he's referring back to how Jesus basically uh, trained the, the, the disciples, right? And we read it in John 13. He loved his own. He loved them till the end. Plan A is love them. And then part of that is train them, equip them, prepare them, right? So is he saying do that with your kids? Yes. Yes. Plan A, love them first. Build a connection with them from, from the first moment you can and every moment thereafter, build a connection with them. Love them. Okay? If, may, protect that connection. Develop that connection. With my kids, that's not how I was taught. I was just taught you just tell them what to do and whack them if they don't. No, build a connection. Build a connection. 
Absolutely. And uh, use leadership principles. And equip them and train them? Yes. Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Right? Jesus had a purpose with this. It wasn't just to have a love fest with these guys, right? He had a purpose, didn't he? I'm going to turn these guys into world changers. And when you're raising kids, there's a purpose. Turn them into decent human beings, right? Turn them into responsible, good people, right? There's a goal in this thing. You want to train them and equip them, but it all, the foundation is always connection and love. If you start to lose the connection and love and you're just going to authority, 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 you're going to provoke them to wrath and the whole thing's going to fall apart. Hmm. When you're raising kids, though, is there a time and a place for authority? Yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And the time and the place, especially when they're younger, that's usually when the battle has to be won, is if they show disrespect, rebellion, defiance, that's where you use authority. Right? And how you use that, you know, that's not what I want to go into today, but, uh, but the way I, I believe in it is it, it should hurt and they should cry. <laughs> and feel bad. Right? That's, but generally, plan A is connection. <laughs> connection and uh, leadership. So I think, I think it's uh, the time we're living in, probably the last 50 years especially, uh, authority and morality has been under massive attack in our society and our culture, right? Right, the whole idea of any godly authority, morality, that's just totally under attack. Men are confused, parents are confused, men don't know how to be men, and parents don't know how to be parents, and all, it's, you know, there's just been just attack, onslaught after attack, after attack, after attack, and people are kind of messed up, excuse me. <coughs> but, it's, and so, you know, people are afraid to discipline, people are afraid to claim leadership, they're afraid to, you know, use authority. When, even when it's necessary, even when it's right and it's supposed to be there. People are all messed up about it. And, uh, and it's, 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 it's causing really bad things. So I want you to know, again, if you're a parent or a grandparent and you're raising or helping raise kids, you have authority and you're called to use it. Right? And God's saying, right, you know, don't, don't lead with authority. Lead with love, connection. <laughs> you know, lead with that. Maintain that. Develop that. But use authority when necessary. Don't be afraid to do it. In fact, it's absolutely necessary. And if you, if you win that battle up to, by the time they're about this tall, you're good. If you don't win that battle then, guarantee you a whole lot of problems after that. <clears throat> right. And if you do win that battle when they're little and you're actually parenting them when they get older, you know what? They're your friend. Genuinely your friend. Hmm. <clears throat> um. Of course, Jesus used these principles. He used leadership and connection mostly, right? And uh, did it work with every one of his disciples? No. no, it didn't. He had at least one that betrayed him completely. Isn't that true? In spite of everything that he did, doing everything right, he had one that said, nope. <laughs> Stole from him, lied to him, betrayed him, turned him in. Right? So even when you do everything right, is everybody going to love you? And oh, No. Now, even if you do everything right, will all of, your child, all of your children just say, oh, thank you, that you did it all right and I'm great? No, not necessarily. There's sin in the world and people are infected. And sometimes stuff will go wrong. Sometimes stuff will go wrong. So, you know, you always want to try for the connection. You always want to try to build the love. You know, but, but if somebody absolutely refuses and won't have it and won't let you connect and won't respect you, all that's left is authority. No, you can't live here. No, you can't have access to my money. <laughs> no, you, whatever, you know. Um, sometimes, sadly, that happens. But uh, go on here. And then five, and, five through uh, nine says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to Christ. In that culture and time, there was slavery, right? It was, um, it was kind of a modified form of slavery, but it was slavery nonetheless. Uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the slaves were highly educated and, and uh, highly skilled, but they were slaves nonetheless. Uh, so, but he says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters. Did he say, did he say, no, that's crazy. 
He's just telling them to be obedient and to honor their masters. In that culture and at that time, that's what he said to do. And Paul in another place said, if you're a slave and if you can be free, get free. He said that. But in that time, this is actually what the advice he gave them. That's very interesting. Uh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Okay. Go ahead. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Huh. Okay. Uh, keep going. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And nine, in you masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your, your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. So we stop there. So now he's, he's addressing you know, a situation where, in that case, it was actually literally slaves and masters. But can we apply that to our... Sure, we can apply it today to all kinds of areas where you're in a position where you're either the person in authority or you're the person under authority. If you work at a job, right, you probably have a boss and that's the person in authority and you'd be the person under authority. Or maybe you're the owner of the company and people work for you, you're the person in authority, they're under authority. Right? Uh, so 360 degree leadership means whether you're the person in authority or not, that's not what we go to anyway. Right? That's not our first go-to anyway. So you can be under authority and still, still exercise leadership to the person above you. Still exercise godly leadership to the person above you. Really? Yeah. Or the person at your side. Right? Yeah, you can, absolutely. That's why he said, bond servants, right, obey your masters and show honor to them. And not as men pleasers just to the eye. Right? Not just putting on a show when they're around and then when they're gone, like, you know mess up their stuff. But he said, serve them with sincerity, knowing that really you're serving the Lord. What? Really? Yeah. He's still saying, have a, have a godly influence, even when you're in a position where you're not in authority, or in your position where you're powerless. You can still have a godly influence and still be the leader? Yes. <laughs> in the eyes of heaven, yes. Huh. That's very interesting. What if, uh, when else... If you're in a church and you're not the, you're not the leader of the church, right? Uh, can you still be a leader of the people around you? Yes. Can you still influence the pastor, right? If the pastor needs help in something and he's going in the wrong direction and, and you're not the person in charge, can you still bring some leadership and some influence? Yes. The only thing you do, make sure, you sh make sure, 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 you do it with you're the person not in authority is you do it with respect. But can you still bring influence? Yes. Absolutely yes. You're always a leader. You're always a leader, right? If you're, if you're bringing the leadership up, just do it with more respect. You know, make sure that's there. Uh, how about if you get pulled over by a cop? At that moment, who's the person in authority? The cop. <laughs> right? the, cop. the rest of the time, they work for us, right? We Taxpayers pay them, right? And they work for the government. However, when he pulls you over, he's in charge. <laughs> Do you respect that authority? Yes. Can you still be a leader and show godly influence to him in the way you respond to the whole situation? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, basically, I, I, think, I think I've finished what I wanted to say. The, the thing I really wanted to unpack for you tonight was the idea of authority, right, versus leadership and uh, leadership is always the go-to maximum leadership minimum authority necessary is the way Jesus does it okay. but he will use authority when necessary <laughs> and don't be afraid to do that either yeah. huh. is that helpful to anybody okay good it's helpful to me that's good all right let's pray let's stand together So my prayer at this point is I, I want to pray that, again, a leadership mantle and gifting will come upon each of you, each of us individually, and also continue to increase upon this church, on this house. So let's just look to the Lord.
turn our hearts towards him. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're making us aware of the call to leadership as a church. And each one of us as followers of Jesus, called to be people of influence, ambassadors of heaven, ambassadors of Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, welcome. Begin to move, I pray. Just begin to fall on people and move in people's hearts. In Jesus' name, come. Holy Spirit, and first of all, pour into everybody's heart the understanding, the revelation of the style of leadership of Jesus. Not authoritarian, but authoritative. Inspiring rather than requiring. Hallelujah. Speaking truth in love. Leadership with strength, with truth, with grace. Hallelujah. Just pour into people's hearts, God. Right now, I pray the gifting and mantle of leadership begin to fall on people here more more <sighs> hallelujah the wisdom for leadership the calling for leadership hallelujah in fact just to begin to actively receive that if you would do that with me just begin to say yes yes lord yes yes Mantle of leadership, come upon me, God. Gifting of leadership, come upon me. I receive that. I want that. I'm open to that. Even if you don't see yourself as a leader, just to say yes. Just say yes. And the Holy Spirit can work with that. You can begin to transform and align your heart. Yes. Yes, God. So begin to be aware even of the people that you could influence, people in your life that will receive leadership from you if you offer it. People around you that will respond, that may need your leadership, will be open to your leadership. Hallelujah. More, Lord, more, Lord, more, more. Leadership anointing, leadership wisdom. Growing in our hearts, God. Right now as we say yes, as we receive, as we position ourselves. take a moment to just one more moment just pray for somebody next to you if you're right next to somebody or you can easily just slide over a bit just lay your hand on their shoulder just just one more moment just pray leadership God pour a leadership gift on my brother my sister pour leadership anointing on them God pray for them pray for them pray for each other leadership anointing God <sighs> welcome Holy Spirit oh Let them grow and become a person of influence, increasing influence, increasing leadership. With or without a title, with or without a business card, with or without 
<laughs> a degree, a person of influence and love and leadership. Good, that's awesome. God bless you all.